Welcome to the Friday matinee here in your hometown station, AM 1220, KHTS. I am T, and I am Georgeless today because George has another project that he's working on. Every now and then we get called away, and so today I get to be with Menji, Andrew Menjivar, who's here uh, as part, he works here at the station, and we're going to talk to a filmmaker, a young man by the name of Cameron A. Mitchell, filmmaker, writer, producer of D. BS Films, and I, I really wanted an opportunity to bring in a guest to talk about the process mm-hmm. of filmmaking, because with what's going on today, everybody has, um, you know, a, a phone with filming capabilities, and there are so many platforms that people can upload information and viral videos, mm-hmm. but to make something of quality, to make something that is the craft of filmmaking, isn't as easy as everybody thinks it is and I thought you know what I want to bring in a young filmmaker I want to talk about the process I want to talk about the art of it and so Minji has very kindly um, pushed you down from Alaska I understand (laughs) you've come all the way down here to chat with us so welcome to the Friday matinee Cameron oh thank you so much for having me I'm really excited to be here oh yes (laughs) Minji is so used to the applause it's like okay yeah the audience is there there. yes (laughs) they are there well sometimes I forget to hold up the sign that says applause (laughs) so forgive me for that so filmmaking tell me a little bit about first of all what what made you decide to become someone who creates content um well i have always loved writing that's always been just a major passion of mine even as far back as i can remember i've been writing i've been just tooling around with these different things and in high school my friends and i made uh, a lot of really kind of dumb now youtube videos but they were a lot of fun at the time and i really loved i hear doing steven them. spielberg has that very same story with his little camera out in the yard with pals so probably a lot of people do so yeah. own it uh, be be proud of that oh, so so yay <laughs> thank you and then um yeah um have you ever been to Alaska? I have. It's very boring. There's not a lot to do. And so, it's very beautiful, though. Yeah, it is very beautiful. It's Visually true. beautiful. Visually stunning, yeah, in, in the summer. But um, <laughs> so I, I lived there for 22 years. And Where in Alaska? Anchorage. Okay. Yeah, it's sort of the uh, the biggest city in the state. There's about 300,000 people who live there. <clears throat> it's pretty big. Yeah, it's roughly. But, um, it's Santa Clarita-ish. Yeah. He's, he's unimpressed. <laughs> yeah, I see <laughs> that. <laughs> by, his, by himself. I'm, I'm not unimpressed, but, you know, it 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 is some place that you humble sort of, beginnings yeah. it's not hollywood it's not exactly. a film capital it's not something it's it's very rural mm-hmm. it's very wild mm-hmm. it's yeah, and so i get i get what you're saying yeah well and i i never really understood why i didn't you know i have some very great wonderful friends up there but i never understood why i didn't have so much in common with them as mm-hmm. i might have mm-hmm. and it turns out that i was just really into film and storytelling and Mm -hmm. writing. And it was something that sort of dawned on me one day that, you know, I had always loved talking about movies. I had always loved making the YouTube videos. And then I realized that I could actually be doing it. And so I just sort of one day up and decided to move to Los Angeles and go to film school. You know what? That's half the battle is making the commitment to doing something oh, as opposed to sitting at home going, well, I could do this here forever. So so yay for you for making the, that bold decision oh, thank to you. come and do that. So school, what what was? I went to, uh, I went to Los Angeles City College down in, um, I guess, East Hollywood. Yeah. And I went there for... F- I Um, went there. I know it. I know it. Yeah, it's it's a very nice school. I went there for two years. I had some really great teachers. I had some good classes. I had some some problems that just happened just because life is difficult sometimes. But what really time? Yeah, (laughs) it's really hit and miss. Yeah, Yeah. Yeah. I'm old. I can tell you that it's it's very often. (laughs) But what really was valuable from there was I met my network. And I met a lot of the people that I still work with now. It's, you know, about half a year later, and I'm some of the most talented people that I've ever known. And they're some of my closest friends, honestly. And I didn't meet uh, Andrew there, but he and I met through a different project. Well, that's the art. Making art is is sometimes a solo craft, depending on what mm-hmm. you're doing and what medium you're working in. But when you work in theater or you work in film, you really have to be a tribe. You have to assemble the 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 other members that you click with, that you understand, that create 
creatively, it's it's a huge part of what you do. So, all right, so you go to school, you 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 build your network, and what, what kind? Let me ask you, what kind of films do you do you like to make? I mean, we all have to do the projects we have to do mm -hmm. to put money in the bank. Mm -hmm. But what were the projects that drove you? Your passion projects? Um, I actually have. I don't necessarily have one certain genre. Something that really resonated me, with me was in um, an interview with uh, Ted Sarandos from Netflix, and he said that the important thing about Netflix was that there is no um, main main genre that they have. They don't just do cop shows or comedies or right. anything. They have something for everybody. And I've always found that... Um, There's a lid for every pot. <laughs> yeah, no, I agree. And I have, um, I have film noir scripts. I have science fiction scripts. I have comedies. I sort of have just a whole large mix that I just love doing. And really what resonates with me more so than specific genres is characters. Mm -hmm. And so I, I kind of come up with these characters and fall in love with them and just want to see what where they live and what they do. Now, is it different characters every time? Or is it like something that really kind of uh, a reoccurring sort of a theme within every character you, you create? I definitely have reoccurring themes. I, I like to think that my characters are different people, but a lot of them definitely have self-destructive streaks. Uh-oh. For sure. Now, now is, are you at liberty to say who, what, what triggered that? Is there someone in your life that you watched and you want to um, teach them? Because storytellers often like to tell the story to mm -hmm. right the wrong, mm -hmm. I find, in, in, in talking to people. Because we got the control to do we so. Have the, <laughs> yeah, it's like having a dollhouse, mm -hmm. you know, where you get to move the characters and you are in, in control of that realm. Was there, can I ask, was there yeah, something no, that absolutely. triggered that? Yeah, um, A lot of it, honestly, is myself. Self-destructive? I, uh, I used to be, yeah. yeah. And I, I tend to draw a lot of different traits for myself. So a lot of characters aren't me to a T, but you can definitely see aspects of myself in them. So this is sort of therapeutic for you. In and you're, you're using it to do good instead of evil with your superpower there, <laughs> if you will. So would that be appropriate? Yeah, I think that's 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 not a bad way to put it. All right. I don't know if it's a superpower, but... Oh, trust me. <laughs> it's just, you'll, 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 your life will get, will get behind you and you'll go, yeah, that was one of my superpowers. She was right. <laughs> So, Andrew, you do a podcast where you talk with filmmakers and, and artists. Walk me through. You did something recently. Right. Um, so, I have a podcast. It's very similar to the Friday matinee called uh, The Call Sheet. And the website for that is thecallsheet.tv. And on I love the self promotion in you. I love that. <laughs> Just a little, you You're know, my pal. shameless plug there. <laughs> Go for it. Um, and on the website, um, I don't just feature the podcast. Um, every blog post is mm -hmm. sort of dedicated to that um, artist. And it's like, um, you, you know, when you the the bigger directors and actors, how they get like on um, inside the actor studio or something, they want to know more and stuff like that. And I. I feel like there's not the big medium for artists to just, you know, talk creatively about their own work because, you know, sometimes it's like, oh, either they're narcissistic or like, you know, I don't, I don't care. I want to know what Christopher Nolan is doing or something like that. You know, <laughs> I don't want to know about this little director, but you know, sometimes, um, they do say a lot of, uh, wisdom, um, in some of their, their words and you can actually learn something from them. And that's, you know, how I've learned a lot from being on set and talking to people. And when I had Cameron on for an episode, we did um the topic was the 20 things that every filmmaker should know and it's uh, a little list that i came together that i put um from experience of being on set um some things that i felt were really really important of course there are way more than 20 things that every filmmaker should know right um but this is what I thought was the most important to me. All right, we've got we've got time to hear some of these. Let's hear uh, your list. All right, so number twenty is oh, we're, going we're going backwards <laughs> all the way up to number one is reputation is everything, and just like um, you were talking about putting together your own little clique, your, your own little tribe mm -hmm. of people, is um, you how do they look? Um, how do they they? view you, you know, and, um, are you a reliable person? 
Hmm. Are you someone that they're going to go to? to um... You don't want to burn your bridges. It's one of the first things you hear when you go to work in Hollywood. When I was a teenager, I went to the high school performing arts, and one of the very first things you would hear over and over and over from the various artistic teachers that work there, do not burn your bridges. Mm-hmm. Because, and so what exactly what you're saying, your reputation is everything. Your work ethic, your creativity, your your everything about you as a as an individual is is what you bring to the table table as a creative person. So I love that. Right. And so. mainly it's an attitude thing as well more than anything. If mm-hmm. you have a positive attitude, you're going to do fine. But if you're negative and if you're difficult, then chances yeah. are you won't. Cheese ball is a cheese ball is a cheese ball, and yeah. nobody wants to work with the cheese ball. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Next one, number 19. And this one is one of the first things that I ever learned was if you're on time, you're late. Yeah, that's right. And I raise my kids that way. It, to be early is to be on time. To be on time is to be late. And to be late is unforgivable. And we will not hire you again. Yeah. Good yeah. one. Um, number 18. Always look busy, even if there's nothing to do. <laughs> <laughs> and always ask, what is there to do? That's a good one, because right. then you look lazy. Good and, one, Andrew. And another one is <laughs> um, people like talking about their work, too. Love you know, it. if you're on set and you don't know about, you know, how a C-stand is supposed to be properly put up or something like that, you know, ask a grip if they're not busy, you know, and they'll most likely love to talk to you about, you know, they'll love the fact that someone's interested in what they have to say. And then Cameron, don't you find that just being educated about every aspect of filmmaking is important? Oh, absolutely. So you're not just getting them to talk about themselves so that they like you. You're actually getting a free education. So yeah, absolutely. Good one, Andrew. Right. Number 17, you're only as good as your last job. Now, Cameron, mm-hmm. let me ask you, because I used to say I made just enough money to have top ramen in my cabinet. How many, how do you, how do you find your projects? Do they, do they come one after another? Do you, are you looking for your next job? It ebbs and flows. I'm always looking. I'm always talking to people about what's happening next. I, uh, I have some people that I work with very regularly that we're always trying to come up with something, but sometimes something just falls into your lap. And I, uh, I'm producing post-production for a short film that the director came to me and my producing partner a few months ago and said, hey, I work for this lighting company. My, it's a very small company. It's called LGI Tech. Mm-hmm. And I, the, he says that the CEO wants to produce a commercial. So he says, hey, if I'm going to direct this commercial, will you guys produce it? And we said, yeah. And then we did it. And it was great. And then on set, there was someone who I guess was impressed and was thinking that maybe he would want to have a commercial as well. So it's, it's sort of a, it can be a domino effect. It can be years of practice yeah. and fundraising. You and used the word earlier. You had to build your network. It mm-hmm. is all about networking. It's Absolutely. All, so, all right. As good as your next project. And the thing is, there's no clear path. No, which is no, no. Like nobody gives no you a map. Nobody gives you a map. Mm-hmm. Here, we're going to teach you some of the art and go. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I think people get confused about that for film school too. Oh, or at yeah. least let down. They come out and they go, where's my job? Mm-hmm. You know what? Start by schlepping coffee across the lot. And mm-hmm. that's how you do, build your network. That's how, I mean, and a lot, I see it all the time. I see, I've had kids actually come up to me and say, can you believe I graduated with a degree from USC and, <laughs> and I, and I don't have a job. It's like, yeah, I can believe that. Yeah, I'm absolutely. sorry that that's shocking to you, but okay. That's why I didn't go to USC. <laughs> so this one, this one's a little bit shocking to some people who first start out is number 16. Know that you are replaceable. Yeah. Yeah. In a moment's notice and f- usually for less money. Right. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you always have to know that there is someone that can do your job better and probably for less and you have to compete with that. Cameron, do you find uh, that that's true that you, you're you're doing the long hours and you just, no matter what, I could be replaced? So there's... Oh, most definitely. It is it is tougher to do on smaller, more indie productions just because sometimes the budget isn't necessarily there or the network isn't necessarily in place to find somebody, particularly if it's a more specialized job like, say, script supervisor. Mm-hmm. But if you do if you do your work, if you do your pre-production, you're going to know these people well in advance, and you pro- hopefully won't have these problems. But if you need to get rid of somebody, then you need to get rid of them. If they're toxic on set, they're going to bring everybody down. They're going to slow down the film. They're going to make the product come out I worse. I wish every company had that, where we <laughs> could just go, goodbye, toxicity. <laughs> All right, Andrew? Uh, number 15, which is directly from number 16, why should they hire you instead of someone else? Now, it sounds like a job interview question, but it's really 
really something you should be asking yourself. You know, what what do you bring to the table that someone that might be doing your job better than you doesn't? It's almost like they talk about the elevator pitch for your project, where if you're in an elevator with someone important, you got to be able to give your project in in one paragraph or less or a few sentences. Mm -hmm. You have to sort of have that mission statement for yourself as a filmmaker to where you know what do you think you bring to the table that you they should have you instead of someone else. I work really hard yeah. and I'm not, I'm definitely not the best at what I do because there's always somebody out there who can do it better, but I am always learning. I'm always trying. I'm going to, if you put me on your project, I'm going to work as hard as I can for as long as I have to. And I'm going to try and get it done. You're yeah. like me. You're that puppy in the window. Pick me, pick me, Kinda, pick me. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I, I find though, is like the people that say that they are the best usually aren't the best at collaborating. Ah, yeah. so there's that. Okay. Right. Um, next one is plan for everything. Do not wing it. Plan for everything. See around corners is what they call that mm -hmm. in production. You need to be that person that can come up with everything that could go wrong mm -hmm. and everything you just might need. And mm -hmm. you have to be able to, that's a good one. Um, next one, number 13, don't believe that you're going to get paid. <laughs> Uh, here's the the thing. Sometimes um, someone will be like, oh, I'm going to produce uh, a pilot. And you know what? I don't have the budget to pay for you right now. But hey, when it gets picked up, you're totally going to get paid for everything. And it's like, <laughs> well, you, you can't put you can't those expecta like that. expectations. You, can't put, ex you yeah. can't put expectations in the bank. All right. What number are we at? We're at number 12. All right. We're going to we're gonna make sure that people come to, to your, your podcast to mm -hmm. find the rest of them. Cameron, I want to ask you, because everybody has the dream of the perfect, you know, I'm going to mm -hmm. go to, I'm going to make movies and it's going to be great. And I'm going to stand up one day and accept my award, but it isn't always like that. They're, they're often talking about seeing around corners and problems. Mm -hmm. Give me an example of what, if you don't mind, what was like, what, like the worst thing you had to encounter as a filmmaker? I have been on some difficult sets. I've shot uh, a short film out in the desert where it seemed that everything that could go wrong went wrong. I have, um, I've shot in San Diego where it was the same thing. Everything that could go wrong went wrong. And honestly, I think that the hardest part is difficult people. Difficult people. Difficult people. On more the than the weather, more than the lighting, more than the things that prevent you from getting really good shots. Yeah, people can absolutely. be the groove killer. Mm -hmm. Now, what do you, what do you do when, when, how do, how do you, how do you deal with the worst possible shoot? Unfortunately, there really isn't, like Andrew was saying, a map, right. and there's not a science What are to some it. of the things you did in the past, then? Give um, me experience. I have, I have fired people. Yeah. It's not something that is a happy story, but I gotta imagine you have, the, they have the, you have the sweetest face. I have to believe they don't <laughs> see it coming. They usually don't, yeah, yeah. and that, that is something that I do struggle with sometimes, is being, being too being nice and guy. being too lenient and having to But you have a project. You have to yeah. have a product you have to deliver. The film has to get made, yeah. and the crew has to be a unit and it's sort of almost a family thing because you're spending 12 to sometimes I've spent 16 hour days on set before and so you need to really trust the people that you're with and you need to be able to work with them and if people just aren't on board with that then it's a problem yeah now are you working on anything currently yes I am we we just finished this commercial this is in post-production right now I have um, a feature script that I'm polishing it's it's mostly finished I'm just sort of working on it and starting post or I'm sorry pre-production it's called bar annulment and it's a thriller about a private detective and a law student who are investigating a law firm. Now, uh, for pre pre production, post production, actual filming, and then the promotion and marketing of, of projects, what is your favorite thing to do? I really love. Weirdly enough, pre-production. I love production because being on set is the most fun. It's, exciting. it's It's the best job in the world, and it's the most fun that I've ever had. And it's really amazing to just see these things come together. But you also get that in pre-production if you're planning it properly, if right. you're doing your storyboards. If you're oh, the world it. is your oyster at that point, yeah, you know. Absolutely. And you're and you're trying. Oh, sorry, camera. <laughs> you're trying to imagine all the possibilities, mm -hmm. and that's like Christmas Eve. What mm -hmm. could be in the packages? So what's your least favorite? Andrew is not going to like this, but it's post-production. Uh, what? <laughs> I, what? I love what can be accomplished in post-production, but because post-production is at 
sort of the end of the line, mm -hmm. you are just so tired. Tired and stressed. Tired and, and stressed. And trying have, to make that original dream come true. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And don't get me wrong. Like I love, I love doing it. I love working with the people that I've worked with. I love working with Andrew, but sometimes you just, you don't really get the vacation that you might need yeah. after two weeks of hard filming or a month of hard filming in addition to pre-production and all that. So I think of the production process, uh, the craft as being, um, thinking that you're going to have a baby and the idea uh -huh. of it. And then you go through the whole thing and you're growing the baby and the baby's born and everything's wonderful. And everybody's just in love with what you just <laughs> did. And then they're a teenager. Post-production is the teenager. Is the cranky teenager? Yeah, the cranky teenager. I can see it. Yeah. Cameron A. Mitchell, filmmaker, writer, producer of DBS Films. If you want to find him on Facebook and our own Andrew Menjavar, your podcast again, give me your website. It is thecallsheet.tv. I love that. I, we like working with Andrew. You're listening to the Friday Matinee here in your hometown station, AM 1220 KHTS. We'll be back after these messages.